Top 20 Narcissists Who Fucked Up, Part 4. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor as we continue our examination of the narcissist that really did mess up. Driven by a sense of entitlement, failure to be accountable, the absence of emotional empathy for other people, the belief that they were untouchable and that nothing could go wrong for them, we study a number of individuals who simply had it all and then decided to shit-can it all. Yes, a group of narcissists that demonstrate their narcissistic credentials, both in terms of their rise and also their falls. We're going to examine more of them. Please do show your appreciation for this work by liking the video and sharing it to other people to increase its circulation. This is very important. And perhaps you may also wish to show super thanks as a consequence of recognizing the amount of work that goes into the production of this material. Settle yourselves down, get ready, and away we go. Number 8. Lance Armstrong A man who encapsulates so many attributes that inspired people, determination, dedication and drive. Armstrong got bollock cancer and was told by his doctors that he had a 20-50% to 50 chance of survival. But they later admitted they lied and they just said that to try and give him something to cling on to. And he actually had a near zero chance of survival. And yet... He did. He stared down testicular cancer and sent it packing, rather like its reputation, when it turned out that he was just a lousy cheat. Armstrong achieved international fame by kicking the shit out of the Tour de France, not just once, not twice, but seven times, between 1999 and 2005. Was he a man? Or was he really part man, part bicycle? Some weird cyborg of Eddie Merckx and a bicycle. Rumours abounded that Armstrong could never actually stand still, because if he did, he would fall over. So he was always having to lean against something. Such were his bicycle-like credentials. When bollock cancer made its appearance, not only did Armstrong say, You can fuck that shit sky high! He then decided that he wasn't going to laze around reveling in his survival. No, sir. Instead, it was back on the bike, and this time he was going to collect. And boy, did he. He went further. He set up the Lance Armstrong Foundation, selling yellow Livestrong braces like crack cocaine and raising more than $325 million for the foundation. He got involved in being the pace car driver for the 2006 Indy 500. He set up Athletes for Hope with Andre Agassi, Muhammad Ali, Warwick Dunn, Jeff Gordon, Mia Hamm, Tony Hawk, Andrea Yeager, Jackie joyner Kersey, Mario Lemur, L Alonzo Mourning and Carl Ripken Jr. He set about running marathons in Boston and New York City again to raise funds for charity. Was this man a living saint? He had stared down the big sea, was world famous, raised hundreds of millions for charity, and, most likely, shat diamonds. Yet Armstrong had a dark secret, which would provide him with his own dedicated lane straight to fucked upsville. He would not have to wait at the traffic lights. Oh no, he was on a direct route into the heart of fucked upsville, because this supposed all-American hero was actually a low-down, rotten scumbag cheat. For much of his career, Armstrong faced persistent allegations of doping. He denied all such allegations, often claiming that he had never had any positive test in the drug tests he had taken over his cycling career. Armstrong had been criticised for his disagreements with outspoken opponents of doping, such as Paul Kimaggi and Christophe Basson. Basson was a rider for Festina at the time of the Festina affair and was widely reported by teammates as being the only rider on the team not to be taking performance-hancing drugs. Basson wrote a number of articles for a French newspaper during the 1999 Tour de France which made references to doping in the peloton. Subsequently, 
Armstrong had an altercation with Basson during the 1999 Tour de France, where Basson said Armstrong rode up alongside on the Alpe d'Huez stage to tell him, It was a mistake to speak out the way I do, and he, Armstrong, asked why I was doing it. I told him that I'm thinking of the next generation of riders. Armstrong said, Why don't you leave then? The cocky cheat was chatting shit too. Armstrong continued to deny the use of illegal performance-enhancing drugs for more than four years, describing himself as the most tested athlete in the world. From his return to cycling in the fall of 2008 through March 2009, Armstrong claimed to have submitted to 24 unannounced drug tests by various anti-doping authorities. Not only was he a cheat, he sought to ride out, pun intended, the allegations and throw shit at others, increasing his rating on the International Douche Canoe Index. In June 2012, the United States Anti-Doping Agency accused Armstrong of doping and trafficking of drugs based on blood samples from 2009 and 2010, and testimony from witnesses including former teammates. Further, he was accused of being an arsehole by putting pressure on teammates to take unauthorized performance-enhancing drugs as well. In October 2012, USADA formally charged him with running a massive doping ring. It also sought to ban him from participating in sports sanctioned by WADA for life. Armstrong chose not to appeal the findings, saying it wouldn't be the worth the toll on his family. As a result, he was stripped of all his achievements from August 1998 onward, including his seven Tour de France titles. He also received a lifetime ban from all sports that follow the World Anti-Doping Code. Accordingly, he couldn't even compete in international tiddlywinks. As nearly all national and international sporting federations, including UCI, follow the World Anti-Doping Code, Code, this effectively ended his competitive cycling career. Not content with wheeling down to fucked upsville by buggering up his hitherto survivor image and glittering career, he also ended up shit canning himself financially too. After USADA's report, all of Armstrong's sponsors dropped him. He reportedly lost $75 million of sponsorship income in a day. That's some going. On May 28, 2013, Nike announced that it would be cutting all ties to live strong. In the aftermath of Armstrong's fall from grace, a CNN article wrote that the epic downfall of cycling star, once an idolised icon of millions around the globe, stands out in the history of professional sports. In 2013, Armstrong settled a lawsuit from Acceptance Insurance Company, where they sought to recover $3 million from him that it had paid as bonuses for winning the Tour de France. In April 2018, Armstrong settled a civil lawsuit with the United States Department of Justice and agreed to pay $5 million U.S. dollars. In 2017, the court determined that the federal government's U.S. dollar $100 million civil lawsuit against Armstrong could proceed to trial. The matter was settled in April 2018, when he agreed to pay $5 million. During those proceedings, it was revealed that the U.S. Postal Service had paid $31 million U.S. million in sponsorship to Armstrong. Just in case you have any doubt that this is a narcissist who richly deserves to be living in fucked upsville, in a 2015 interview with BBC News, Armstrong stated that if it was still 1995, he would probably do it again. Well, he's now a resident of fucked upsville, so he's not going to get the chance to do so. Number 7. Ghislaine Maxwell Epstein acolyte and international madame, convicted sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell became a certified member of Fucked Upsville. In a sense, there was always a high risk of her finding herself in Fucked Upsville being the offspring of pension thief and floating corpse Captain Bob Robert Maxwell, who after stealing $583 million and ruining the lives of 32,000 Mirror Group newspaper pensioners, decided to fall in the sea and die. Aptly, the yacht he took a tumble from was named the Lady Ghislaine, named after his favourite child. Thus, it really was no surprise to find his daughter getting involved with dubious behaviours and sexual chicanery. Maxwell was raised in Headington Hill Hall, a vast Italiante mansion overlooking Oxford in the United Kingdom. Rather than buying it himself, 
Her father had somehow persuaded its owner, Oxford City Council, to rent it to him for a minimum sum in return for renovating the property. It was, he said, the best council house in the country. Throughout Ghislaine Maxwell's childhood, lavish parties were thrown at Headington Hill Hall with politicians, celebrities and media grandees in attendance. Maxwell grew up in opulence and a very connected environment. Her home was in actual fact an abusive one, but we're not here to shed any tears for her upbringing, so balls to that. She was educated at Marlborough College and Oxford University, where she studied modern history and languages. It was very clear to me, even as an undergraduate, that she was interested in power and money, says the writer Anna Pasternak, who was a contemporary at Oxford and moved in the same circles. She was one of those people at parties who always looked over your shoulder to see if there was somebody more powerful or more interesting while she was air-kissing you. Rachel Johnson, sister of tousled-haired serial liar Boris Johnson, former UK Prime Minister and another Oxford contemporary, recalled spotting Ghislaine Maxwell across the Balliol Junior Common Room. She was a shiny glamazon, with naughty eyes holding court astride a table, a high-heeled boot resting on my brother Boris's thigh. Maxwell had money, knew where power resided, and knew how to utilise the networks that she had been exposed to. She also started her campaign for admittance to Fucked Upsville quite early on, by seeking to defend the indefensible, her father. He wasn't a crook, she said. A thief to me is someone who steals money. Do I think that my father did that? No, I don't know what he did. Obviously something happened. Did he put, it in his, did he put the money in his own pocket? Did he run off with the money? No, and that's my definition of a crook. Furthermore, she kept on knocking at the gates of Fucked Upsville by insisting that her father had been murdered, even though her other siblings accepted that he died by accident or it was suicide. Despite her attempts to get into Fucked Upsville, she didn't do so at the first attempt, and instead, the fallout from the Mirror Pension scandal made the United Kingdom a less than welcoming place for her. In November 1992, it was reported that she'd bought a $4,000 one-way Concorde ticket, not to Fucked Upsville, but to New York. Having learned to service the monster that was her father, she then cozied up to a second one, Jeffrey Epstein. Ghislaine Maxwell's relationship with Epstein was no doubt mutually beneficial. She could introduce him to her wealthy and powerful friends, and he in turn had the capital to fund the kind of lifestyle that she had grown up to expect. Thus, Maxwell did a deal with the devil. He would fund her lifestyle, and she would recruit young women as his lieutenant for him, and her on occasions to abuse. The wealth she enjoyed, courtesy of the soon-to-be offed pedo, meant that she never believed that fucked Upsville would be her final destination. In court documents, former employees at the Epstein Mansion in Palm Beach described her as the house manager who supervised staff, looked after finances and acted as a social coordinator. A housekeeper testified that Maxwell gave staff a 58-page instruction manual and ordered them to speak only when spoken to, avoiding eye contact with Epstein. In July 2020, she was arrested at her secluded mansion in the U.S. state of New Hampshire. All of a sudden, a parking permit for Filthy Pervert Avenue in Fucked Upsville was becoming a reality. Whatever the exact nature of their relationship, the prosecution portrayed the closeness between pervert Epstein and pervert Maxwell as a crucial factor in their pattern of abuse, with Maxwell seeking out and grooming victims for Epstein. In December 2021, a jury found her guilty of five of six counts, including the most serious charge, that of sex trafficking of a minor. On the 28th of June 2022, Maxwell was sentenced to 20 years in prison. She faces a second criminal trial for perjury on two charges that she lied under oath during a civil suit in 2015 about Epstein's abuse of underage girls. Here was a woman who was expensively educated, who was a mate of Prince Andrew, who got to hang out on Crown property, who had access to wealth through Epstein and enjoyed a privileged lifestyle few could imagine. Yet she decided to facilitate the abuse of young women, unable to prevent her ultimate destiny being a cold concrete cell in prison with a 20-year prison sentence and, of course, automatic entry to Fucked Upsville. Notwithstanding this move to Fucked Upsville, 
She did demonstrate a sense of humour, as in August 2022, her former lawyer sued her because she'd failed to pay them $878,000 in legal fees. At least, the boar-washing bastards had not been paid. Something for her to smile about as she contemplates another evening in the cell with Big Bertha and her badly stuffed kebab. Number 6. R. Kelly It appears that we are staying at Sex Case Central with our next denizen of fucked upsville. Robert Sylvester Kelly, known professionally as R. Kelly, is an American singer, songwriter, record producer, but now largely known for being a convicted sex offender. What a twat. He has been credited with helping to redefine R&B and hip-hop, earning nicknames such as the King of R&B, the King of Pop Soul, and the Pied Piper of R&B. Perhaps more accurately, he should be known as the Pedo Piper of R&B. In hindsight, it was only a question of time before R. Kelly ended up in a shitty rundown shack at the arse end of Fucked Upsville. Kelly described having a girlfriend, Lulu, at age eight in his autobiography. He stated that their last play date turned tragic when after fighting with older children over a play area by a creek, she was pushed into the water, swept downstream by a fast-moving current and drowned. Kelly called Lulu his first musical inspiration. So, here we have a guy who takes musical inspiration from a drowned eight-year-old. Seems legitimate. No fucked-up individual there, is there? Kelly also said that members of his household would act differently when his mother and grandparents were not home. This included women walking around half-naked. Who were these women? Additionally, Kelly stated that when he was at the age of eight, a female in the household asked him to watch and photograph her having sex with a male partner. I get the distinct impression that R. Kelly kind of failed to tell us that he was living in a brothel. After what seemed like an inauspicious start for our sexual predator, R. Kelly then looked like he was flipping the bird to fucked upsville as he embarked on a very successful musical career. Kelly had 18 studio albums and was known for hit singles such as I Could Believe I Can Fly, Bump and Grind, Your Body's Calling, Gotham City, Ignition, If I Could Turn Back the Hands of Time, The World's Greatest, I'm a Flirt, and the hip hopera Trapped in the Closet. In 1998, he won three Grammy Awards. Although he's primarily, or at least was, a singer and songwriter, he has written, produced, and remixed songs, singles, and albums for other artists. In 1996, he was nominated for a Grammy Award for writing Michael Jackson's song, You Are Not Alone. He sold over 75 million albums and singles worldwide, making him the most successful R&B male artist of the 1990s and one of the best-selling music artists of all time. The, record indus the Recording Industry Association of America has recognized the pervert as one of the best-selling music artists in the United States, with 40 million albums sold, as well as only the fifth black artist to crack the top 50 of the same list. In March 2011, R. Kelly was named the most successful R&B artist of the last 25 years by Billboard. Throughout his career, Kelly has won numerous awards, including a Guinness World Record, as well as countless other awards like Grammy, BET, Soul Train, Billboard, NAACP, and American Music Awards. Quite the career. Fame, talent, and money. Just the kind of heady brew that just needs the addition of a sexual deviant, and that bus ride to fucked upsville will soon become a reality. And that is just what R. Kelly did. In a spectacular but unsurprising move, R. Kelly engaged in multiple unlawful sexual activities with underage girls and included in one instance the degenerate actually urinating on one of them. The deviant did not so much deserve a plot in fucked upsville, but a whole neighborhood isolated in solitary to himself, preferably where stray dogs would invade his porch where he would be sleeping and piss on his head, night after night after night. Investigations by law enforcement and journalists revealed that Kelly used his fame to seek out underage fans for sex. Video recordings of these encounters led to him being prosecuted, but he was acquitted in 20, 2008. The 2019 documentary television series Surviving R. Kelly re-examined his alleged sex misual, sexual misconduct, prompting RCA Records to terminate his contract. Confirming that this individual is a fetid turd of the lowest degree, he sought, through a Facebook page, to discredit his accusers, because that always works, doesn't it? 
Notwithstanding Facebook taking the page down and people thinking that he was an utter see you next Tuesday, this deluded sawdust brain pervert kept going, this time appearing on Gail King to bleat about how he was innocent and blame social media. Naturally, the Zuck must have been sending him secret and coded messages instructing him to nonce children. Unsurprisingly, his chest-beating tantrum on Gail King's show just made people think about 20 different ways to cause maximum pain to R. Kelly while burning all of his records. He was arrested in July 2019 on new charges, and in 2021 he was convicted under the Mann Act for racketeering. In 2022, he was convicted of three child pornography charges and three charges of enticing a minor. He was sentenced to serve 31, 31 years imprisonment in a combination of concurrent and consecutive sentences. As of 2023, Kelly is incarcerated at FCI Butner Medium 1. He is scheduled for release on December the 21st, 2045. But he won't ever be leaving Fucked Upsville. Number 5. Oscar Pistorius. The Blade Runner now shares a bathtub with fellow resident of Fucked Upsville, Lance Armstrong, residing in the disgraced athlete's quarter. Whilst Armstrong didn't do chokey and never killed anybody, Pistorius opted for admission to Fucked Upsville by throwing away a career and in a fit of jealous rage shooting his beautiful girlfriend, subsequently ending up in prison. What a total cock. Oscar Leonard Carl Pistorius is a South African former professional sprinter and convicted murderer. Both of his feet were amputated when he was 11 months old, doing to, owing to a congenital defect. He was born missing the outside of both feet and both fibulae. Pistorius ran in both non-disabled sprint events and in sprint events for below-the-knee amputees. He was the 10th athlete to compete at both the Paralympic Games and Olympic Games. After becoming a Paralympic champion, Pistorius attempted to enter non-disabled international competitions. Over persistent objections by the International Association of Athletics Federations and arguments that his artificial limbs gave him an unfair advantage, Pistorius prevailed in this legal dispute. At the 2011 World Championships in Athletics, Pistorius was the first amputee to win a non-disabled world track medal. At the 2012 Summer Olympics, Pistorius was the first double-leg amputee participant. Pistorius won a slew of gold medals and widespread admiration for his determination and ability. In 2006, he was conferred the Order of Ikhamanga in bronze by then-president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, for outstanding achievement in sports. In 2007, he was awarded the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Helen Rollinson Award, which is conferred for outstanding courage and achievement in the face of adversity. In 2008, he made the Time 100 magazine's annual list of the world's most influential people, appearing third in the Hero and Pioneer section. Eric Weihemeyer, the first blind person to climb Mount Everest, wrote in an essay that Pistorius was on the cusp of a paradigm shift in which disability becomes ability, disadvantage becomes advantage. Yet we mustn't lose sight of what makes an athlete great. It's too easy to credit Pistorius' success to technology. Through birth or circumstance, some are given certain gifts. But it's what one does with those gifts. The hours dedicated to training, the desire to be the best, that is at the true heart of a champion. In February 2012, Pistorius was awarded the Laureus World Sports Award for Sports Person of the Year with a Disability. In August 2012, he was honoured with the unveiling of a large mural depicting his achievements in the town of Gamona in Italy. In September 2012, Pistorius was shortlisted by the IPC for the Wang Yun Dai Achievement Award as a competitor who is fair, honest and is uncompromising in his or her values. After the summer 2012 Paralympics, the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow announced it would confer on Pistorius, among others, an honorary doctorate. In 2012, Pistorius had sponsorship deals worth $2 million a year with Osir, BT, Nike, Oakley and Thierry Mugler. He also participated as a model in advertising campaigns. The Blade Runner had the medals. The title, the money, the praise and admiration and a hot girlfriend. 
the boy Dungard. So it was evidently time for this narcissist to fuck it all up and ordered a battered taxi to take him to Fucked Upsville. On the 14th of February 2013, Pistoria shot and killed his girlfriend, paralegal and modder, model Reva Steenkamp, in his Pretoria home. He claimed he had mistaken Steenkamp for an intruder hiding in the bathroom, which made no sense whatsoever to anybody with a functioning brain cell, and resulted in a mass head shaking at his shithousery. He was arrested and charged with murder. At his trial the following year, he was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of culpable homicide. He received a five-year prison sentence for culpable homicide and a concurrent three-year suspended sentence for a separate reckless endangerment conviction. Pistorius was temporarily released on house arrest in 2015 while the case was presented on appeal to a panel at the Supreme Court of Appeal of South Africa, which overturned the culpable homicide victim at, uh, verdict rather, and convicted him of murder, finally getting their shit together in relation to this murdering rage child. In July 2016, his sentence was extended to six years. On appeal by the state for a longer prison sentence, the Supreme Court of Appeal increased the prison term to a total of 15 years. Following the murder charge, sponsors were initially hesitant to abandon him, but after a week, sponsors began to withdraw their support. In February 2015, following his conviction for culpable homicide, the University of Strathclyde revoked the honorary degree. His BBC Personality Award was also thrown out of the window. Another narcissist wallowing in a prison cell, and one who, unable to control his ignited fury, ended up murdering his girlfriend, telling porky pies, and thus was grabbed by two muscled men, a pillowcase taped around his head, and upended into a laundry cart, to be taken to Fucked Upsville, where he now cries to Lance Armstrong, who uses Pistorius's blaze to shoot cow shit at Pistorius's head from across the crack den that they share together. Another four narcissists who fucked up. But who's going to make our top four in the final part? Well, join me in part five to find out. <laughs>